Good morning. I am Pastor Deborah Bell, and I serve as a senior pastor at the Russell Hoover Memorial United Methodist Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. We are excited today because we are now having a joint service with our sister church, the Wesley Chapel United Methodist Church in Little Rock as well, where the Reverend Ronnie Miller Yow serves as the senior pastor. So again, thank you for joining us this morning on our online worship experience. And our theme is to the one that overcomes. The presence of the Lord is here today among us, protecting us and loving us and encouraging us. Amen. We come as a people of hope to witness God's power, fixing our eyes on what is true and right and holy. May our hearts and our minds dwell in the peace that only our Lord can provide. Brothers and sisters, again, you are welcome to the joint online worship service of the Russell Hoover Memorial United Methodist Church and Wesley Chapel United Methodist Church. We are indeed grateful to God for your presence with us today. Now, let us prepare our hearts to worship our true and loving God. Please join us in the call to celebration. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. And also with you, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. My shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Amen. 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 Now we will have our prayer points and announcements. Thank you. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, we greet you in the holy name of Christ. My name is Ronnie Miller. Yeah, I have the privilege to serve as the pastor of Wesley Chapel United Methodist Church. And it's good for us to be here today and to share this experience with the Theresa Hoover Memorial United Methodist Church. It is good to be here. Brothers and sisters, at this time, I wish I extended you the opportunity to um, type in your prayer concerns. If there are prayer concerns, want to lift up uh, both churches, want to lift up the Theresa Hoover Church, want to lift up the Wesley Church, want to lift those that are on our collective prayer list, those that are sick and shut in, and those that just have struggled uh, with just managing and navigating through this COVID experience. We believe God is able, and as our theme suggests today, we are overcomers. We are indeed overcomers. Let us now be in the spirit of prayer. Gracious God, we come to you with humble hearts and bowed heads before your throne of grace. We come praising you because you are worthy to be praised. Yes, God, you've been better to us than we've ever been to ourselves. So today, God, we come to you. We worship you. We honor you. We bless you. Your name is worthy to be praised. Your name is hallowed in this place. And so, God, we pray that you would move in a mighty way in this worship experience. I pray that you would touch every speaker, touch every preacher, oh God. And God, I pray that you would just give them courage to to declare that which the Spirit would say to us on today. I rebuke every anxiety. I pray for a, fray, a fresh flow of your anointing that it would be up on us even now. I pray, oh God, and today that you would even bless this effort, this effort to bring your people together. I pray, oh God, you said in your word, God, that there is strength in unity, and you said in your word it is in unity. It is at the place of unity. It is there that you command the blessing, even life forevermore. God, we ask for your life today, life in our churches, life in our homes, life in our marriages, life in our families, life in our state, life in our city, life in our country, life in our nation, life in our world, oh God, in the name of Jesus. We believe, Father, we're living in the last days. And so as John writes to us, and as the people of God declare unto us today, we pray, oh God, that you would give us 
lost the strength uh, uh, not to give in or give way to the tactics of the devil, but that we would overcome because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God, as we gather, gather with us and don't let us leave the same way we entered the room. It's in Jesus' name we pray and the people of God said together, amen, amen, amen. It is now time for the offering time, the giving of our gifts, where we give back to God a portion of that which God has given us. God has indeed been faithful to us. He's been faithful. Oh my God, he's been faithful. And all he asks, <laughs> all he asks is for a dime out of a dollar. Listen, I'm not going to ask you what I always ask. Isn't God worth a dime out of a dollar? Oh my God, Minister Washington always brings uh, to the Wesley Church these words found in Malachi. He always jumps in front of the congregation. He says these words. He says, will a man rob God? And I remind him, yes, and women will too. Uh, listen, listen, brothers and sisters, it is not God's desire. It's not God's desire. Oh, that we miss an opportunity to be blessed by him through the ministry of giving. On your screens, you will find information for the Theresa Hoover United Methodist Church as well as the Wesley United Methodist Church. Now listen, if you go to Theresa Hoover, don't send your ties to Wesley. If you go to Wesley, don't send your ties to Hoover. Listen, send your ties to your church, but it's the collective work that we're doing together that honors and pleases God. And so listen, the information is on your screen as we prepare to give at this time. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are a great God. And the truth be told, you've been good to us. Help us, oh God, not to be selfish, but help us to freely and willingly 
share with you, to share with the church a portion of that which God has given us for the building up, for the building up of the body of Christ. We pray that as we give, that these offerings would touch those that are hurting. We pray that as we give, that these offerings would touch those that need to feel the presence of a living God. We pray, oh God, that as we give today, that God, the presence of God, will be felt throughout the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and the people of God said together, amen. amen. Praise God from all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father.
Chapel United Methodist Church, some of the best sought after preachers and teachers and facilitators, as some refer to themselves. Oh my God, people of God, to declare the word of God. Listen, let me tell you something. The Bible, we just got through celebrating Pentecost Sunday on last Sunday. And one of the things that Joel says to us, the prophet speaks to us, Sister Smith knows this well, that in the last days, he says, he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Here is the good news of the text. He says, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Well, let me tell you, the sons and daughters are here today. And brothers and sisters, we're in for a treat as we hear the word of God declared through them. Listen, their information will be on the screen as they present. But I pray today that you would sit still. Sit still. Don't move. Don't change the channel. Sit still and be in the presence of God as these speakers come to us to rightly divide the word of truth following the song that is presented by the music ministry, the next voice you will hear will be the men and women of our various churches. To God be the glory. Amen. Good morning. Morning. I'll be reading from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And it reads, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do your first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. Can you imagine through so much chaos and confusion, and then God sends an angel to have you communicate a message of warning? I believe that was the last thing on John's mind, especially if he was almost burnt alive. But yet he was still a servant despite the turmoil he was going through. Regardless, God still calls us to serve him and to meet a need. Therefore, in this text, we have John interpreting what the angel put before him and revealing to the seven churches through a multitude of warnings about their life as a believer. Today, I will try to share what was revealed to me about the church of Ephesus, of which I've already read from Revelation 2, chapter verse chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In the book of Matthew, chapter 5, 14 through 16, we find Jesus speaking to his disciples about the multitudes of people. And he goes on to remind them of who they are and what their call is in the world. And it reads, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Mama nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We have to ask ourselves, have we gotten caught up in our good works? Have we gotten caught up in the folks patting us on our backs and lifting us up with feel-good words? Have we gotten caught up like Ephesus and left our first love? I don't know if the church of Ephesus recognized the signs of them drifting from their first love. I don't think Ephesus knew that they had left their first love. Mm -hmm. Yet, they are admonished in leaving their first love. They are admonished in forgetting why they carry out these acts, doing what they do. They are admonished because they are only able to do the good works because of God. But like Martha, they forgot. They have gotten caught up in making everything look presentable and not spending enough time with God. Well, how is that, you may ask? They were teaching and sharing the word. Yes, but it became ritualistic. It became a habit. It was no longer sacred. It became a task. It was on the things to do list. Things that I need to do to get closer to God. Yet God is saying, you left me. You see, remembering requires you to stay in a mode of reflection. It requires us to examine ourselves on a constant basis. To examine our motives. Ask yourself, have I fallen to idol worship? Am I now worshiping my good deeds that glorifies God instead of worshiping and loving the creator? Amen. After remembering and examining, we have to be willing to repent. Yes. We have to turn away from the wrong being done. And sometimes turning away means turning away from the good things too. We have to turn away from the good things that inflate our ego. Okay. We have to change up. Amen. Stop doing what you are doing. Mm -hmm. And last and certainly not least, we have to return. We have to return back to the love of God. Yes, Lord. We have to return back to how we fell in love with God. We can't love others correctly if we aren't even loving the Creator correctly. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. If you have stopped communicating with God through prayer, it is now time to start back up again. Yes. If you have stopped worshiping, it is now time to start back up again. Yes. Those are just a few acts to acknowledge God. Return back to how you showed your love that first time. Return back to the fundamentals of loving God. Your fundamentals, your beginning, not someone else's. Hmm. The ways that show 
your love to God. God is still being faithful. Mm -hmm. But are we? Thank you. Dear God, help us be faithful in loving you back. And help us turn back to loving you first versus our good deeds. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. I wanted to get that out because it's important for us to know that we got to be encouraged. Hallelujah. We got to be encouraged and know that he will never leave us or forsake us. And, 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 and today I want to talk about having faith under fire. Amen. Having faith under fire. Uh, let us pray. Father God, we thank you right now for this time to share. God, I'm asking right now that you help me to decrease and you increase. God, give me what to say and how to say it. In the name of Jesus, prepare the hearts and minds of your people, O oh God. And Lord, let the word fall on good ground, O oh God. Take root and grow. In the name of Jesus, we pray. You said one man plant a seed, another man waters the seed, but you're going to get an increase. And God, we, we believe it in Jesus' name. We pray. We ask this blessing. We thank God. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. I give it unto God today who is ahead of my life. Give it unto to the pastors and all the saints of God that's here on today. And it's a blessing to be before you on today. Amen. It's a blessing to be able to share. It's a blessing to be in the knowledge of God. So I give it unto God today for another chance for life, health, and strength, the use of the activity of my limbs. And I thank him right now for another day and another opportunity to get it right. Amen. You all pray my strength. There's a saying uh, that says, uh, I might not have a million dollars in the bank, but I'm rich. I'm rich. It says, uh, uh, I'm rich in spirit. Some people equate being rich with having lots of money. But how many of you know that money can't buy everything? Come on, somebody. Can't buy your joy. Can't buy your happiness. And show can't buy you no peace. Listen, it says, I know some would beg to differ. Uh, money is a sensitive subject because it deals with the haves and the have-nots. Uh, it's often tied to race, religion, and relationships and the like. Uh, uh, however, it is vitally important for the believer to know and understand that money ain't everything and that we have treasures, and those treasures we can find only in Christ Jesus. Amen. Listen, the late Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart, said on his deathbed that he would give all the money he had just to have more time on the earth. Saints, as long as we have life, we have a chance and an opportunity to show and prove, thank you, Jesus, our love for God and not this world. Listen, go with me to Revelations, the second chapter, verses 8. Through 11. That's Revelations, the second chapter, verses 8 through 11. You have it? Say amen. Amen. And the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Right. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God, hallelujah, amen, amen. Here Christ acknowledges that the church in Smyrna is a faithful congregation undergoing persecution. And the way that they were being persecuted was with their, with, their, with their economy. They weren't allowed to, to buy, sell, 
or, 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 or because they were Christians, they were being persecuted. And we, we, that's tied to race a lot of times. Now we think about the, the average income of, uh, 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 of some more affluent households and other households. There are, you know, there's a wealth gap in America and we hear about the wealth gap all the time. And we hear about economic segregation. And that's something that many of us can have been through or have experienced. It says, so, so these folks in, 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 in the church in Smyrna, it says, it says that uh, uh, they, are first, they are faithful congregation and they are under persecution. They're undergoing persecution. Some who claim to be Jews were actually a synagogue of Satan because they were doing the devil's work. Amen. How many of you know that there's spiritual wickedness in high places? Amen. Slandering Amen. believers. Look, Christians uh, at Smyrna would be thrown into prison. Uh, as, as a test of their faith and the church would be afflicted. And, and we hear about this, uh, I hear about folks over in China and how in other places where, where they uh, deal with uh, uh, persecution because they serve God, because they are Christians, because of their faith. Uh, we hear about people being killed in other places because of their faith. And so here, uh, they, they, the, the, the church in Smyrna was being persecuted because of their faith. It says Christians at Smyrna would be thrown into prison as, as a test of their faith, and the church would be afflicted. Uh, while such circumstances might make them feel poor, uh, you know, a circumstance can make, you, make us feel poor. You know, it could be, it could be, I don't know, maybe you lost your job or, or, you know, even this going through this pandemic we've been through, it can make us feel poor. It said, but they were actually rich. They were rich. They were rich due to the coming reward for their spiritual endurance. Amen. Amen. The race is not given to the swift nor to the strong, but to those who can endure. Right. Listen, to those who refuse to compromise when faced with persecution. Listen. There is no condemnation. First, Jesus gives them a description of himself. Uh, he says, he said, he, he came to life after he died and is alive forevermore. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the ending, the alpha and the omega. He goes on to diagnose the healthiness or unhealthiness of the church in Smyrna. He reassures them. Uh, when, when he states, I know your tribulation. Listen, y'all, God know what we go through. He said he know your tribulation and he knows your poverty and the, and, and the slander. That mean, that mean when you run this race, folks gonna talk about you. Folks gonna lie on you. Folks gonna misuse you and abuse you. But he say, run this race with patience. And listen, listen, listen. It says he goes on to die. It says he reassures them. Listen, he states, I know your tribulation and your poverty and the slender. These believers are suffering because they are being persecuted. Uh, how many of y'all know what I'm talking about? It says these believers are suffering because they are being persecuted. Jesus knows and understands what these believers are going through. True faith endures. Listen, and God allows us to be tested. Did y'all hear what I said? That God allows us to be tested. So don't think it's some strange thing that's happening. Don't get all messed up, frustrated, and in the wrong spirit. Stay faithful. Stay, Stay faithful. saved. Yeah. Listen, it says that, it says that, it says, and God allows us to be tested in order to gain glory through the powerful work he has done inside of us. Something on the inside is working on the outside on our behalf. And we got to know. Look, we, ne we can't doubt him because we know too much about him. He did it before. He can do it again. He don't change. Come on, somebody. It, say, it says, and God allows us to be tested. Listen, 1 Corinthians 9 and 24 and 25 says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one received the prize? So Run that you may obtain it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God, hallelujah, amen. 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 Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. The scripture passage I have to read this morning comes from Revelation chapter two, verses 12 to 17. To the angel of the church of Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. 
Yet you remained true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you have also told those who, who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The, the church at Pergamum is directly addressed by Jesus himself. The church was situated in a pagan town where it would have been in the middle of many cultural beliefs. The very fact is noted in its name, which means where Satan lives. The city was so corrupt and so evil that it could have easily overtaken the believers of the church. Jesus directly addresses the messenger or angel at the church of Pergamon probably a person in leadership. Jesus addresses the church's faithfulness to the gospel in the midst of living in such a sinful place. Overcoming has much to do with how we see our outside world and live in the faith that God will and does strengthen us to live up to the standards God has set. The church at Pergamon was not Altogether, however, Jesus said to the messenger that he recognized that the church had become entrenched in the society and the cultural norms surrounding them. The ultimate problem that they had to overcome was not unfaithfulness, but letting go of what they held on to. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold on to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold on to those teachings. Soon I will come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. They still were stuck in some of their old habits. And the ways this was, in ways this was a warning, a judgment from the direct mouth of Jesus, a call to true repentance. They were to be in the world, not of the world, as we would say in our modern day context. I believe that in order to overcome something that withholds us from being all that we are in Christ, we must acknowledge our sin. The church was doing well on the outside, but corruption was leading and inbreeding them on the inside. They had signs of practices of sexual immorality and sacrifices to idols. They had to acknowledge this in order to avoid the true judgment of Jesus. The reference of coming to fight with the sword of my mouth is Jesus sending a message of warning to the church. The word of God is like a two-edged sword, fighting sin on the left and destroying it on the right. right. In order to overcome sin, we must know that the word of God and that will allow us to see the sin and have the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome. To those who overcome are aware of the truth, to liberate and set free. Jesus calls the church of Pergamum and the church of today to true repentance, 
Repentance that turns us around, away from the world, and turns us back to the word of God that strengthens our hearts. We are a chosen people, a holy people, and we are called to live as such. Knowing that none of us are perfect, but we are made perfect through Christ. It is only by the blood of Christ and the love of Christ that we are able to overcome and to stand before Christ in judgment. When we repent, we are not consumed by the things of this life, by the things of this world, but through prayer and supplication and the power of our testimonies, we overcome. All right. The church at Pergamus was no different than where many churches are today standing in the middle of destruction, struggling to remain relevant in the lives of those we serve, yet we will not sacrifice the unadulterated word of God from the Lord, Amen. which we have been given as a guide for our life. We must not sacrifice our holiness for the idols of the world, and we must remain true in spirit to worship God in spirit and in truth. Can you hear what the Spirit is saying? Christ is calling for action. He is speaking directly to the church gathered here today. Amen. The Spirit is calling us to victory, to overcome the things of the world and to stand apart from them. To not be entangled in the sinful, in the sinful nature of the world in which we live. Brothers and sisters, there is a reward for those who are victorious. I will give some of the hidden manna. The hidden manna is the understanding of God's word. God's revelation is not given to all, but to those who seek and worship God. And they worship him in spirit and truth. God reveals the knowledge of himself through the word and through the spirit. Discernment allows us to hear the word of God and to see things that we would not otherwise see in our carnal mind. Discernment allows us to avoid the traps that have been set for us. We have this power. We have this power. When we listen for the Holy Spirit, not only collectively, in the church, but individually in our lives. We are given knowledge. So God promises to give us a treasure only known to the one who receives it. We are unique to God, yet we are called to stand in unity together as the church against the evils of a sinful world. The sins that were pointed out in the per church of Pergamum were no different than what we see on today. Some of these things are rampant in the church and in the world, and we are able to overcome them through the hearing of the word of God and the doing of what it says to do. As we testify to what the Spirit has to say, let us stand together as one body. Let us acknowledge the sin that we see. Let us glorify the one and true God who is able to bring judgment and redemption and let us hear what the Spirit is saying on today. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Let us turn to Revelations, the third chapter, verses 1 through 6. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what time I will come to you. Yet you have few people in Sardis who have not soiled them, their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. 
The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the spirit says to the churches. Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask right now that you remove this servant, that you be lifted. Let my frailties diminish and your word go forth. In your son Jesus' name, amen. 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 The House of Sardis. I can remember a show that used to come on back in the late 60s, early 70s that was a sci-fi uh, show that was set in um, outer space. And one of the characters' main tagline was, warning, warning Will Robinson, warning Will Robinson, yeah. danger, danger. I hear the voice of Christ saying not only to the house of Sardis, but to the today's church. Warning my children, warning my children, your pride and haughtiness brings destruction. Sardis was the capital of the ancient kingdom of Lydia, one of the most important cities of the Persian Empire. It is important, due, was, it was, its importance was due first to its military strength, second, to the situation on the important highway leading from the interior to the Aegean coast. And thirdly, to its commanding the broad and fertile plains of Hermas. The story of the church of Sardis is the saddest of all the seven churches. It's the story of tremendous pride, as well as illustration of, of how pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. That's Proverbs, the 16th chapter and the 18th verse. It stands as a warning to those who think they can stand before God dressed only in their righteousness. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse 12. The church in Sardis boasted in its life. Its reputation in the community shouted clearly and unequivocally that it was alive. But in reality, this church was dead. So Christ wrote in verse 1, however, the fact that the ch however, the fact that he, uh, he wrote to the church suggested that he deliberately exaggerated his death to emphasize its precarious condition and the genuine danger of impending death. If it were dead, there would have been no point in writing it. Verse four and five also shows that the language here is hyper, hyperbole. Point one, we see the house of Sardis is a dead church. Christ said to the church at Sardis, I know thy works. He has said the same thing to each of the four churches that we've considered thus far. In these earlier instances, he meant I know the works and I'm pleased with them. But here, the meaning is precisely the opposite. The end of verse two says, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. There was little praiseworthy in the church at Sardis, Sardis that Christ could not only fail to command it for anything, but simply pronounce it dead. It had become stagnated apathetic and lethargic in his service to Jesus Christ. As a result, no longer deserved the reputation that it had enjoyed in previous years. The church at Sardis did, didn't suffer from the same problems plaguing Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergus and Thyatira. These other churches were communities that were actively hostile to the truth. All of them were challenged to one degree or another with false doctrine. But Sardis, the city, and the church enjoyed relatively peace. I want to pose this question to you today. Could the church of Sardis be revived again? The hope of resurrection had not been wholly extinguished. 
To the dead church of Sardis, Christ gave five commands. In verse 2 and 3, he commanded the people to be watchful. Strengthen the remaining things. Remember what they had received and heard. Hold fast to those things. And last but most important, repent. The church had to live according to the grace that is professed. The first two commands be watchful. Wake up. Strengthen the remaining things. In other words, Christ required the church to perform a diagnostic self-examination. It needed to see for itself where it stood in relation to him. Was it still walking by faith? Was it worship or serving service springing out of a heart warmed by love of the crucifixion and resurrected by our Savior? Or did it follow the motions of service as mere formality? Christ charged the church of Sardis to find the answers to these questions. Every believer should perform similar diagnostics regularly as a wild spiritual life often leads to disaster. That's why Paul exhorted believers to think they stand to take heed lest they fall. Christ's second command required that it be reinforced or strengthened. The church still had a pastor that was preaching the word of God. If the Lord can bring light to, out of darkness simply by commanding it to be so, light of knowledge of the glory of God to shine in the face of Jesus Christ in this congregation. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6. He does so in the church's public ministry. When you get right down to, to it, the Spirit of God applying the Word of God is all that's needed for reformation. Christ insisted that the dead church remember what the people had received and heard with the third commandment. That is, was to return to the basic teachings of the gospel. Oh they should remember the goodness of God in, his, in redeeming sinners through, the, his, through his death of his only begotten son. Scripture admonishes us to examine ourselves constantly to reassure ourselves of the standing before God. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, Examine yourselves to see whether you're in faith and test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus in you, unless, of course, you fail the test? Let us never presume that we have satisfactoriness in ourselves, but us, let us always find acceptability in Christ alone. He will uphold those who seek his grace and mercy through his shed blood. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, in Philippi to describe the attitude and service that will protect a church from becoming like the house of Sardis. He wrote, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13 says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Philippians, the second chapter, verses 12 and 13. The danger of neglecting our spiritual life is that we may never return to it. May God himself keep us from that effort that we might un overcome, not through our works, but the grace he has for us, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, God. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. There is a song. I wish I had the courage of Brother Arlo and could sing like Pastor Yao. But there is a song by Albertina Walker, and I encourage you to look this song up. And in this song, she says, in times like these, we need a Savior. Huh, nah. And in times like these, 
We need the Bible. But she goes on to say, in times like these, we need a revival. So, my topic today is the letter to Laodicea. Oh, my God. You know I love my pastor. I do. I tell the world I love Pastor Yao. He has a tendency to give me tough subjects. <laughs> and I appreciate that because it makes me study. It makes me read my Bible. It makes me ask the Holy Spirit to give me the discernment of this word. Amen. How do I apply this to my life? Amen. How do I share it with people he has assigned me to teach? Amen. How do we apply this word to our everyday lives? The letter to Laodicea, uh, and I like the way we've been doing our Bible study. We're looking at the context in which the letter comes. We're looking at from whom the letter comes, and then we're looking at how we apply the letter to our everyday lives. Amen. So I'm going to read briefly, uh, quickly, the letter that was written in the book of Revelations given to John on the Isle of Patmos from a messenger. But the words, these words, are the literal words of Jesus. And you know how I know that? Because I have a red letter edition of the Bible. <laughs> and in the red letter edition, it lets you know that those words in the Bible that are read are from directly from the mouth of God. Amen. The second thing about this red, and Pastor reminded me that last Sunday, we're talking about last Sunday, the day of Pentecost, there was a fire that came, and that fire is symbolized by red. Mm -hmm. I noticed the, the decorations on the altar reflecting the fire of God. There was a problem with Laodicea. So I'm going to read what Jesus is saying to John to record. These are not John's words. These are Jesus' words. And he says here, write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the amen. We're going to talk later about who the amen is. The faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. Mm -hmm. I know your works. Mm -hmm. That you are neither cold nor hot. Yes. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, you, the people, mm -hmm. I'm rich. I have become wealthy and need nothing. Mm -hmm. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, Help poor, Help blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire mm -hmm. so that you may be rich. White clothes so that you may be dressed yes. and your shameful nakedness not be exposed. Yes and ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. Mm -hmm. So be jealous and repent. Mm -hmm. See, I stand at the door and knock. Yes. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Amen. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the church. And it ends, thanks be to God. Now, I want to go back over just for a moment and remind you that this is Jesus, the Son of God, who is recognized by God as holy. God says Jesus is holy. Amen. We don't have a voice in that opinion. God said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Don't listen to me. I've already asked the Holy Spirit to speak through me. Because yeah, right. sometimes I get caught up in me. But when I let the Holy Spirit have rule and dominion over whatever I say, then the words, trust me, are coming not from me, but from him. So he is warning us. He is God, our Father. Yes. And just as some of you are parents, some of you are children of parents, who have said to you, because I love you, 
I have to discipline you. Well. Sometimes, and I tease my pastor because he messes with me. I said, I'm going to get the switch. <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes parents, you have to get not necessarily a physical switch, but you have to let your children know when they are out of order. And, and it's amazing. I was talking to my daughter who now has a grandson. And she said he is so mischievous, but he knows when he is doing something wrong. As a child, he knows when he is doing something wrong. You don't have to tell him it's wrong. He knows, and he will test you to see if you're watching him and his behavior. And, and you've seen children, they tip and they look back at you when they're doing something that's out of order, and they touch it, and they look to see what you're going to do. And they go a little further, and they see how much you're going to do. So we have, in the church here in Laodicea, decided that we no longer need direction and correction from God. Because why? We're wealthy. We're rich. We're comfortable. Uh, I thought about these words of putting me kind of ancient, but they're words like lackadaisical. Mm -hmm. They're complacent. Yeah. They're comfortable. Mm -hmm. So they're enjoying their riches now. Mm -hmm. And they go to church and it forbid God for them to have to say amen. Mm -hmm. Don't even think about getting up shouting. Wow. Don't even think about running around the church, Pastor Bell. I'm going to signal her out because she said one day she wanted to run. Mm -hmm. But what they have become is very comfortable in their wealth, in their attitude, so they don't feel like they need to do anything more. Now, the scripture tells us that we are not saved by our works. Mm -hmm. We're saved by grace, through faith, yeah. lest any man should boast. However, James tells us we're not saved by our works, yeah. but if we are saved, we will work. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? So, here we have a group of people who are so satisfied in their lives and where they are, that they don't feel like they need to do anything other than go to church on Sunday, maybe or maybe not give tithes and offerings, some do, some don't, and then they go home. And that's the end of it until the next Sunday. But in the meantime, what are they doing for God? Where is the witness? Where is the defense of the faith? When someone approaches you, what is your response? Do you simply say, oh, well, that's them over there? You know, we don't do that in our, in our church. We don't, we don't, uh, uh, Pastor, I think he said, roll on the floor, the holy rollers. Well, maybe not rolling on the floor, but you could kind of pat your hands every now and then. You, you could say an amen every now and then. But they're saying here that they are so comfortable in who they are that they no longer feel the need to express any other appreciation to God. When you love someone, you give them praise, you give them hugs, you give them love. We are to uh, epitomize God's move in the earth by being an example to those who are not, quote unquote, where we are, or where we think we are. He goes on to tell them here that he knows their works. They are neither hot nor cold. You got to get into the word, you got to study the word, and it's upon the word that you build your faith. The word tells us that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. But you cannot contact him if you have not built a groundwork for that contact. Here he's saying he will give you an opportunity if you will simply listen. And I, I like my mother and I talk about her all the time. She would give us instructions about what we need to do while she's away from home and even while she's at home. And then she'll say, after she has given us instructions, did you hear me? Well, she knew I heard it because I heard her talking. But what she meant was, are you listening and do you intend to obey my instructions? And you have to give her some kind of symbolism back to say, yes, mama, I heard you and I'm going to do it. The charge here today is let anyone who has ears to hear, listen, hear, listen. How would he have those two words together? Hear, listen. If, you, if he's saying it, and your audible voice, your audible ears hear it, then the listen must mean something more, right? Listen has an implication to it, that you are going to act on what you heard, right? So here he says, then he says, what the Spirit says to the church. Not, not some, uh, something told me, 
or I had a feeling. We, we have to give honor where honor is due. The Holy Spirit communes with us. He will invade your thoughts if you allow him. If you allow the Holy Spirit, he will guide you. He will direct you. I like that scripture that says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. There is a word to us today. When you hear the word of God, do not harden your heart. Break up the fallow ground so that you can establish the righteousness of Christ in your life. Jesus has given the church at Laodicea instructions. Now, here's the thing. Everybody in the church of Laodicea is a believer, supposedly. But if there is a belief, then it should be followed with some action. It's not good enough to say, I believe, and that settles it. No, I believe, and thus I will do what the Lord says. And then it's settled. But until you activate the word of God in your life, you are like some nasty, lukewarm coffee or some warm, stale water. Can you understand why Jesus would spew it out of his mouth? I love the word of God because it gives me an unction every day to get up and see what can I do today with my life to give God the glory. Now, I know some of us want a little bit of glory for ourselves, and we have complacently said, well, to God be the glory. No, no. You have to activate the word. You have to activate when you give God the glory. You have to activate when I'm talking to you, when I'm talking to my sisters and my brothers in Christ. I want to be a bold witness for the Lord so that I do not wind up being like some lukewarm coffee yuck that Jesus is going to spew out of his mouth. I want to be able to sit with him on the throne. Hallelujah. Right? Because then I will be in the spiritual realm, right? God is a spirit. Jesus is a spirit. The Holy Spirit is a spirit. So that we worship him in spirit and in truth. And I thank God for this word today. I thank God that there are three things that he has asked me to leave you with. These things are, and some mentioned them earlier, self-reliance means that you are doing some self-examination. You cannot rely on what you don't believe. Self-righteousness. You have no righteousness but the righteousness of Christ because we all have been in sin. And the word of God tells us here, we contend in sin that God grace may amount, God forbid. Then the last one is we have to remove ourselves from spiritual indifference. That we no longer feel like we need a movement of the Holy Ghost. I want to thank you for listening. I hope that the word of God has touched your heart. Yes. And I ask you to continue to pray for us, pray for this church, pray for the world. Pray for all of those who are suffering right now. And I leave these words with you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Oh my, what Holy Ghost filled, spirited, five awesome lay people who have brought us a mighty. Could you not feel their spirits in all that they shared? So now that you have heard from them, you know, Reverend Yao said, I want y'all to preach. Well, guess what? They kept saying, no, we're going to speak. Each one of you all preach. So we want to praise God that they have done an amazing job bringing us the word today. Now, we realize that there are seven churches, but we today shared with you five churches. And every one of those churches was a chance to learn about the history. But there is only one church. Amen. 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 So this morning, we want to, again, thank you for joining us. And now this is the time for the invitation. So our theme is, is uh, to be an overcomer. So we know sometimes we are still fighting and struggling and uncertain and we feel like we have fell down and we don't know how to get back up. The day you have an invitation for the two churches who want to help you overcome whatever mess that you might have been in. We want to be able to walk with you to help you realize that God loves you. Sometimes we hit the bottom and you don't have anybody to stand with you or help pull you up. We want to reach our hands to you and bring you under the fold of God to one church that knows how to love you unconditionally. So this morning, thank you. If there is anyone who is willing and who's hurting and who needs prayer, you can just put in the chat box there. We'll be more than happy to pray for you. We have intercessors who are ready. And if you feel that, you know, you have, you just don't know what to do at this point, we want to walk with you too. 
So again, this is the invitation for you this morning. We want you to know that you can be an overcomer. You know, and sometimes there are people who are out there say, you know what, I just need to, I need to start over. I'm a believer, but I need to start over. And we're here for you as well. So again, we want to just take this moment to know that, want you to know that the Lord is your strength, he's your shield, and we are the disciples who want to walk with you. Amen. God bless. To God be the glory. To God be all the glory. We truly we honor God, uh, to Pastor Bell, and to all of the wonderful persons that have presented to us today. Truly our hearts burn within as we heard the word of the Lord. Um, tomorrow is Memorial Day, and so we want to um, uh, just pause or remember all of those that have gone before, those that have served in, in our government, in our armed forces, but just to those, this is, 2021 have just been hard times. We've lost uh, many persons, and I just want us to have a special prayer for those that are bereaved, and that they will continue to hold them before the Lord, knowing that God will hold them and keep them. Uh, that is our sincere prayer. Would you pause with me in prayer? Gracious God, we just thank you. We thank you for the word of the Lord that has been given and imparted into our spirits. We know that the word of the Lord does not go out void, but it accomplishes that which it was set out to accomplish. We give you glory, oh God. We give you glory for your word. Now, God, I pray in the name of Jesus that today it fell upon good soil. Now produce the harvest in Jesus' name. Father, I lift up bereaved families to you. Those who are managing, God, holidays and spaces and places with our loved ones they love so dear. I pray in the name of Jesus that the Holy Spirit would be a comforter in the name of Jesus that will comfort hearts and God and give us faith to face the future on a free. Now, may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding God, our hearts and our minds, in Christ Jesus, this is our prayer, oh God, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen.